The Box by Jim Lee, read by Richard E. Grant. Who is this chap, Jim Lee, you may be thinking? What does he know about dealing with adversity? You would be right to ask. I would too. After all, I'm no one special. I'm just another guy hit squarely between the eyes by the most goddamn events that could befall anyone. When he was still in his early teens, my son was killed in a car crash. From the moment I was told what had happened, I found myself somewhere so far away from anywhere I had ever been that I knew that if I couldn't deal with it, I would go mad. So I had to find a way through. I'm not an academic. I'm not a writer, in fact. I'm both dyslexic and a little dyspraxic. I'm just me. It was in setting out to try and survive, quite simply, that the idea of the box was born. I was 35 years old in 1981. My son Orlando and I had been living together, just the two of us, for eight of his 13 years. They were to be the last eight years of his short life. On the 29th of March, 1981, a Sunday, at about 10 o'clock in the evening, there was a knock at the door of my house in London. It was the police. They told me Orlando had been riding in his mother's car in Norfolk when it was in a head-on collision with a Range Rover. He had been killed almost instantly. I was stunned to silence. In the days that followed, I couldn't hear people talking to me, and I couldn't talk myself. I lost all coordination in my speech. I couldn't even finish a sentence. It was as though every time I opened my mouth, it was a pointless process. The finality of never seeing Orlando again was unimaginable. It felt that half of me had died too, and was pulling me towards the heavens. I wanted to be there with him. He was too small to go there alone. People tried to comfort me, but I didn't want their warmth. I only wanted Orlando's. So I went away unconsoled and alone. Some crossed the road, probably because they didn't know what to say. Others spoke to me differently, making the world an even stranger place. Everything seemed utterly unreal. Life was a haze. I began writing down things that I wanted to remember about Orlando, in a panic that I would forget. I tried to recall the last thing he had said to me. I even found myself yearning to give his mother back what she had lost, to get her pregnant again. This was a preposterous notion, since we were divorced and she and I were in long-term relationships. The pain of Orlando's loss was just unbearable. We had been father and son together. There was no hope of an end or resolution. I felt so terribly alone. I knew there was going to be no easy way to fix this monumental tragedy. But I desperately wanted to overcome these ghastly repeating feelings of loss to fill the gap somehow. Anything but be like this. And it all felt just too deep, too personal, too intimate to discuss with others. No one, I believed, could do it for me. Except me. When I was growing up, there'd been a tramp living at the bottom of our garden. Albert had built his little shack around a tree and had a small holding, complete with a couple of chickens, a donkey, a vegetable patch and a dog. That was all. There, he lived off the land, a so much simpler life compared with the sophisticated and comfortable one that I had been raised in. To me, it seemed like heaven. Albert was to shape my whole life from now on. When I had the chance, I bought myself my own little shack, a quaint old showman's wagon with cut glass mirrors and velvet curtains. I restored it myself and found an idyllic remote place for it deep in the Dorset countryside. It became my refuge, warm and womb-like. 
my refuge for just sleeping, cooking, reading and pondering, evoking some of the best moments of childhood, when my mind was still in its youth and life was just less complicated. By this time, I was married with a growing family and a demanding career that took me all over the world. But after the tragedy, I have to tell you where I went. I went to ground. Sometimes it may feel good to go back to your earliest memories, either wonderful or horrible, just to get a perspective on how you are now. As children, we tend to sort out our problems in a very simple way. For one thing, we stay in the present, something that's so important in life. Dwelling too much in the past while trying to race into the future tends to mean neglecting the now. After Orlando's death, much to the apprehension of my closest family and friends, to my caravan is where I went. To begin with, I was crying until there were almost no more tears to cry. This was a kind of relief. In crying your heart out, there is a catharsis akin to the calm contemplation that follows lovemaking. I would lie back, exhausted, staring into oblivion, thinking, how am I ever going to get my head around this? Once I had wrung my eyes out of tears, I found that I could think more clearly about things. Day and night I was bombarded by what had happened 24-7. If every moment of every day was not to be absorbed with the awfulness of my loss, I had to find a way to stop being constantly reminded of it. However, when you're able to just exist in the simplest sense, your mind comes to look at life with similar simplicity. It may have been harrowing to confront the vivid ghastliness of my situation, but in my caravan, I was safe. This enabled me to face up to what had happened. I felt better being there with my pain alone. I found it wasn't better to share it. I didn't need others talking to me, telling me it was going to be all right. I needed peace. It was the best sanctuary of all. I spent 10 days there, completely alone. Eventually, a moment of clarity came to me. I needed to simplify my thinking, control my emotions, and get a grip, albeit slowly. There was far too much to process here in one bite. Logic seemed essential to me, but how on earth was I going to look at things in a logical way? It was then, at the caravan, that I began to shape the idea of the box. I remember that old method of coming to a decision where you take a piece of paper and draw a line down the middle, then list all the pros down the left-hand side and all the cons on the right-hand side. Well, that was no good. Everything seemed so bad that the right-hand side was full and the left-hand side had nothing on it at all. But there was, nevertheless, something pleasing about that blank piece of paper. It was empty, uncluttered. And the line I had drawn, I liked that too. It was simple, direct, went from one place to another. My mind was anything but like this. It was all over the place, a complete haze. I could see already there was something in this, and that I had discovered something already. I played around with the line and made it into a square, a box, if you like. It was still a pleasingly simple shape, clean and white and empty. But now I had a space that was contained. It had nothing, but it could be filled. You could put stuff in it. I looked again at my long list of all the bad things on the right-hand side of my original sheet of paper. All those huge feelings of loss, all those unbearable things I was trying to get my head round. Why don't I take them all, I thought, and put them in the box.
And how about I keep them in there, with the lid shut, and take a look inside only when I feel like it? Without my consent, all those emotions wouldn't be going anywhere. This was now a nice feeling. And when I'd had enough of looking inside, I could always close it and walk away. And so I announced to myself that everything in my mind about Orlando, the whole tragedy of my loss, was going in that box. Everything that confused me, all the feelings racing through me, was going in. At first, I actually wrote down on a piece of paper all my feelings that were going to go in, so I would remember to take them out and address them the next day. Somehow, the act of making a list was itself a comfort. But if it was important enough, I quickly realised I would remember anyway. I was worried, to start with, that in doing this, I was ignoring Orlando and the feelings I should be having about him. Was it not right that I dwell on the ghastliness of the event? But I soon realised I also needed to protect my sanity and follow my instincts. For sanity's sake, I decided to set aside just half an hour every day to open the box. For 30 minutes and 30 minutes only, out of every 24 hours, its contents would have my special, formal, focused, 100% attention. Then I would close the lid again and walk away. I would allow myself to see what was preoccupying or upsetting me most that day, then open up my heart and mind to it, and it alone, trying to lay the matter out logically in front of me. If the thoughts came back to me randomly during the rest of the day, I would say to myself, no, not now. I'll deal with it tomorrow when I go to my box. I call this a passive action, intentionally not doing something. Initially, it may take willpower, but think of not doing something as involving minimum effort. On any one day, moreover, I would set out to try and process just one thing at a time. To begin with, it was hard to discipline my mind, but when I came back to the box the next day, I had a sense of having moved on a bit in my thinking. Sometimes I'd feel I'd addressed what was burdening me and come to a kind of resolution by the end of one session. At other times, it might take several. It's a bit like going to the gym and exercising, then resting the next day. It gives your muscles the time they need to recover and to actually build. It sounds harsh, even ruthless, to limit one's thinking about such massive issues to such short periods. But having that half hour a day of going to the box was so much more productive than being plagued by my trauma 24-7 to the point of distraction. The chaotic, scattergun thinking that would come every five minutes. If one allows one's heart to just express emotion without some handle on dealing with the fallout, things just get out of hand. The box and the brief window of attention I allowed its contents each day contained the enormity of this situation. Here's how this actually worked in practice. A month or so after Orlando died, I went to the park with the dog. The ground was littered with conkers and without thinking, I gathered two pocketfuls as I'd done every year for him so he could play conkers at school with his friends. It wasn't until I got back home and emptied my pockets that it hit me. He wasn't here anymore. He'd never play conkers again. He'd never need me to collect them for him again. I threw them on the floor in a rage. I was distraught. There could be three such events in a single morning, even in the space of a single hour. I couldn't possibly deal with even one of these enormous experiences, let alone three. And so, a realization like the one about Orlando playing Conkers, with all the helpless, overwhelming emotions that came with it, went into the box. It seemed so ruthless. 
I also worried about forgetting the precious yet unbearable memory that had come to me that moment. But I was adamant that I would deal with it again the following day when I went to the box. A full half hour one day could be spent on processing just that. Maybe the three things that hit you on one day would need three days' worth of visiting the box to put it into some sort of order. If I didn't do something like this, I would be storing up endless tales of woe. Better than that, analyse the situation, come to terms with the facts, find some clarity, take heed and move on with compassion. And think of it as I did, this way. Wouldn't Orlando prefer that I get on top of the situation rather than just drown in grief? I was thinking of Orlando and what he would want for me. I'm convinced it was a logical approach that was winning out. I realized it was actually a kind of gift. Where, you might ask, did I visit the box? Well, I picked two places. Quiet places where I knew I would not be bothered by anything at all. I chose a time in the early morning so as to free my mind up for the rest of the day. One was in the countryside, a tranquil place where I could hear only the sound of the birds tweeting beside a tree that had the most amazing gnarled bark. This very old beech was the granddad of trees. It had a magnificent trunk. Its girth would have needed three men holding hands to encircle it. As I looked up, the branches seemed as big as trees themselves, and the umbrella of foliage that spilled down was sensational. It felt as though I was being looked after by this gigantic old soul. Being among natural beauty really helped. There is something out there that pulls me to a better place, and perhaps once we leave this world, we will find it. Natural phenomena, the very idea of the universe, of the energy of our environment, concentrated even in something like the weather, are such great influences on our daily lives. We live in awe of their inexplicable power. I simply stared at that gnarled bark for a full half an hour and gave my profound attention to what I had to think through. Then I got on with my day unhindered. In London, I chose the Brompton Oratory. It was near where I lived, and it too was calm and soothing. Silence is very powerful. There, each morning, I lit a candle and watched it burn, mesmerised by the flame. It gave me a sanctum that seemed spiritual, but not directly religious. How could you not feast your eyes on the oratory's space and beauty and not become absorbed into such a fantastic backcloth for your musings? I'm not quite sure how to define the difference, but there at the oratory, while I didn't feel the need to rely on any former religion, I did wish to be at one with the greater good I associate with the better points of humanity, honesty, humility and love. It was important in these two places to give myself up to the things I had to think through in the most vivid detail I could summon. Our instinct is to avoid the ghastliness and hope it will go away, but it won't. It needs to be confronted head on. Somehow I found I could do this in these places I had designated as kinds of shrines. For me then, it was the bark of that tree where I could look inside the box. And it was the oratory. But it could have been looking down at the Thames from the embankment. It could have been staring at a seascape or a tranquil valley. Anywhere. So as long as it's far away from the stress of people, mobile phones, computers and anything distracting. Where you choose is all important. Somewhere you can empty your soul. Somewhere whose scale, be it sheer majestic size or a more sacred seclusion, 
can absorb the enormity of the horror you have to confront. Somewhere where it will feel okay for you to leave such things to be looked after. The box was not an instant solution for me, far from it. Life doesn't work that way. It took me four years to feel more or less at one with life again. Four years. Even now, many years on, I still have to process things on a regular basis. But it's like anything. If you get into the habit of it, it becomes second nature, and that makes it easier. This daily ritual of putting problems in the box is not a unique idea, but certainly taking them out for a limited, intense interlude of contemplation became, and still is, one simple element in the discipline of my day. Everything we do needs time. Rome was not built in a day is still one of the truest things ever said. And so, I'd recommend doing what I did. Dealing with the most important thing on your list first, carefully and deliberately, then gradually working through the rest. Remember, if your list of the box's contents is 10 pages long, each thing you strike off is a real achievement and there will come a point where you feel a real sense of cutting out the dead wood and planting new trees. The first person I talked to about the box was the actor Alan Bates. He became in a way my first sounding board. He was playing the lead in a film I was directing, even though he had just lost a son himself. I think he had agreed to it because I told him I too had lost a son. It had only been a year earlier that his son had died, and he was still laid waste by grief. He said to me, I went to my box today and had a thoroughly good go at. Afterwards, he told me he felt much better. We all have issues in our lives which preoccupy and agonize us to such an extent that they cannot be sorted out in one bite. They need not be as traumatic as mine, such as losing a loved one. But troubles can come at you any time, without warning. Losing your job, breaking a leg, the taxman hounding you, negotiating the sale of a house. Most of us, when something bad befalls us, or we are faced with a stressful dilemma, tend to go into a spin and everything just gets muddled up. There is nothing worse than being in an emotional mess. So something is testing to the point of distraction and unable to be solved in one bite. Then try my method. This is what the box is for to me. Be logical. See a problem looming, put it into the box and onto your list. And then schedule the time to open the box and deal with it. Once something goes into the box, it's been removed from the emotional chaos spinning in your head. Be ruthlessly organized. Sort out an order of preference for your problems and then prioritize the most pressing. That's logical, isn't it? Give them half an hour a day, the half hour you choose. Then close that box again and tell any thought that ambushes you now at any other time no, not now. This way, I would fill my head and day with more positive thoughts and structure, making me busier and less listless. Once it's inside the box, we can stand back from our emotional muddle and look at it from afar. It might as well be someone else's, and we can contemplate it as though we're advising them. If you can look at them as though you're another person whose handling of this kind of issue you rather respect, then for the moment it absolves you of carrying quite the same responsibility for the answer. But in the end, we have to sort out our own problems. But I think there is something even more satisfying about successfully navigating all of these emotional feelings as I did, thanks to the box. 
even when you look back and remember how upset you were by something, you can see that by thinking your way through it in a disciplined, logical way, you've not only leveled with your problem and got back the equanimity and understanding you had before, but you've also gained a higher, greater wisdom. This is so satisfying and something to be justly proud of. So, if something is casting you into a pit of despair, and it happens to all of us from time to time, think from the start how you can take advantage of the disadvantage. It is possible. My box was a mental box, a box I drew for myself in my mind. I think it was partly a product of my dyslexia. My mind was a cacophony anyway, as a result of the tragedy that had befallen me. The solution was not one for which I could find words, let alone write out the solution. There's no reason why you couldn't or shouldn't make yourself a physical box, if you like, writing actual notes and putting them in it, to be kept there safe until you want to literally lift the lid and examine what's in it. Children have much simpler minds than ours, but they can be beset with terrible losses and crises too. The death of a pet, grandparent, parent or sibling. They might embrace the box as a way of tackling things. An actual box they could make for themselves. To summarise, I believe in putting all my energy into today and the now. Yesterday is already history. And tomorrow is crystal ball gazing. I feel it is important to become empowered by one's experiences rather than be overpowered by them and better to accept the situation and move on. Simplicity is the key to understanding problems and applying logic was the way forward for me. It even helped me to find a sense of humour in the ghastliness to relieve the tension. And life goes on. Somehow, going through life's woes has made me stronger, wiser and humbler, I hope. Above all, I don't feel afraid to go to my box, as it really helps me in my hour of need. And if the emotions come pouring back during my day, then I remember and say to myself, No, not now. Tomorrow, when I visit my box you too can overcome. You must try. It is possible. Believe me. I did it. And it works. <laughs>